An elderly man dies alone in his home Xanadu while whispering the words, Rosebud. The man was publishing tycoon Charles Foster Kane, and everyone wants to find out what Rosebud is, and its true meaning, and why it was Kane's dying words. Where we explore the complicated life of Charles Foster Kane, as we see him grow from a young man into an old man, along with his triumphs and downfalls. Where we learn the secrets of Rosebud, a sled that he played with as a child. Released in 1941, Orson Welles' masterpiece Citizen Kane has gone on to be regarded as the greatest movie of all time. An influential movie which paved the way for what cinema would become. However, behind the scenes there was lots of controversies, including threats of lawsuits, bad press, health issues, bannings, and personal conflicts. Citizen Kane may have brought people lots of joy in its now 80 years, but it was a very rough journey to get there. So today we are going to look into what many consider to be the greatest movie of all time by exploring 10 things that you didn't know about Citizen Kane, where hopefully we can learn the true secrets of Rosebud. So, let's check it out. Number 10, Orson Welles was hesitant to get into the movie business. Orson Welles in his early days was a theatre performer who wrote plays and starred in them, as well as radio shows, including the infamous War of the Worlds incident, when people generally thought aliens were invading. In fact, he loved the stage medium so much, he refused to switch over to movies, despite getting offers with studios like Warner Brothers offering him roles. However, in 1939, Wells was finally persuaded into the industry by signing a contract with RKO, which stipulated that he could write, produce, and star in two movies, with him being given many creative freedoms, like choosing his own cast and crew, and having final cut privileges, which is almost unheard of for new incoming talent. So RKO must have really wanted Wells quite bad. Wells's theatre company that he founded, the Mercury Theatre Company, would also co-distribute whatever movies that he would go on to make. It was financial issues that led Wells to Hollywood, thanks to losing money on two of his stage plays. His intentions was to just stay in Hollywood for a couple of months and make enough money to pay off his debts and then go back to the theatre industry. However, things changed when Wells was given a tour of the RKO movie studios, which he called the greatest electric train set a boy could have. Wells didn't just stay in Hollywood for a few months and then leave. He would go on to have a lifelong career with the art of filmmaking in both Hollywood and Europe. Number nine, things got off to a slow start. The as mentioned contract that was made with Wells and RKO caught the attention of the press, and both Wells and RKO were often mocked and ridiculed for the unprecedented contract. But there was no panic as it was felt that the attention was actually good publicity. So five months had passed, and Wells was yet to produce a script. The Hollywood Reporter even joked about the issue, saying that there were probably bets made at RKO to see if Wells ever does make a movie there. Till finally, Wells did come up with a script. Nope, not Citizen Kane, not yet anyway. But a script called The Heart of Darkness, which was based on an 1899 novella and a story that Wells had previously adapted into a stage show. So The Heart of Darkness went into production and some test footage was filmed, but Wells ended up having to abandon the production as the budget was considered too high and that $50,000 would have had to have been cut from the budget, which Wells felt that he couldn't do. So it was curtains for the Heart of Darkness. However, Heart of Darkness would eventually get a movie adaptation with Francis Ford Coppola's 1979 masterpiece, Apocalypse Now. Number 8, Charles Foster Kane is based on real tycoons and not all of them were happy about it. 
Orson Welles would team up with fellow scriptwriter Herman J. Mankiewicz, and they would brainstorm ideas that would evolve into Citizen Kane. They wanted this character study about a mysterious mogul to be authentic and base Charles Foster Kane on real people, including tycoons Samuel Insull, who was an inventor and played a big part in America's electrical infrastructure, businessman Harold McCormick, newspaper publisher Joseph Pulitzer, yes, that's where the term Pulitzer Prize comes from, and fellow newspaper publisher and businessman William Randolph Hearst. In fact, Hearst was a major influence when it came to the creation of Charles Foster Kane, as co-script writer Mankiewicz knew Hearst on a social level. Hearst was so pissed off that the Kane character was somewhat based on his own life, he flat out banned the movie from ever being mentioned in any of his newspapers. Yeah, more on that later. Yeah, well, I guess he didn't take it well. I would love to know exactly what it was about the character that offended Hearst so much. Number 7. Script Writing Debacle so it seems that nothing was easy sailing when it came to the development of Citizen Kane, and nowhere is this more evident than with crediting the script, which was all out war. As mentioned, Citizen Kane was conceived by Orson Welles and Herman Mankiewicz. From Welles' perspective, Mankiewicz was a script doctor, with Welles giving him notes and ideas and leaving him to write a draft, with Welles then reworking on what Mankiewicz had delivered. And Wells' contract stipulated that he would get full writing credit for the movie. But shortly before Citizen Kane's release, Mankiewicz felt that he deserved a co-writer credit for his contributions. Mankiewicz felt that they were really doing him wrong, and threatened to take his story to the newspapers and to write an expose on the ordeal in the Saturday Evening Post. And he even suggested that he'll take his grievances up with the Screenwriters Guild and claim that he wrote the script entirely. So, RKO then decided to credit Mankiewicz, but for his name to be second after Wells. But it was then decided to credit Mankiewicz's name first, supposedly at the request of Wells himself. But either way, Mankiewicz grew a bitterness towards Wells. A bitterness that he had with inside him that he kept until the day he died. The whole ordeal created one of the most notorious Hollywood scriptwriting controversies ever. There are still debates, even to this day, among people as to who the true writer of Citizen Kane was. In 1978, a film study professor called Robert Carringer had read all the scripts and drafts of Citizen Kane in order of when they were written, and he came to the conclusion that the script was mainly the work of Orson Welles. And if that's true, then that's gotta suck, as the whole ordeal gave Welles something of a bad reputation. Then jumped to 2020 and there was a Bioware pick about the ordeal called Mank, which starred Gary Oldman as Herman J. Mankiewicz. And the movie mainly leads towards the idea that Mankiewicz was the main writer of Citizen Kane. So honestly, at this point, who knows? We may never know the truth. Number 6. Orson Welles' Health Issues Needless to say, while making Citizen Kane, Wells gave himself to the production and went all in 110%. Sadly though, this meant that he wasn't really looking after his health. Wells was 23 to 24 at the time of making Citizen Kane, where the actor-filmmaker would consume up to 30 cups of coffee a day. Yikes, like, that's a lot of coffee, man. In fact, Wells drank so much coffee, he actually got caffeine poisoning. So it became clear from there that his coffee drinking ways had to stop. So instead he switched to tea. But that still didn't help either. As he was drinking so much tea, it caused his skin to change colour. I don't even know how that happens. Wells would often go for long periods of time without eating. And when he did finally eat, he would purge his hunger. With huge meals that often consisted of three steaks. Well, what can I say? I guess Orson Welles just loved his coffee and steak. Number 5. Further Injuries Welles didn't only have health problems due to coffee and tea to worry about, but also his physical health, as during the infamous scene where Kane smashes the room out of sheer anger and emotion, Welles really got into the part and really became one with the character and the destructive force of the moment. So while filming that scene, he actually cut his hand quite badly. While filming another scene, Welles fell down a staircase and injured his ankle, which was so bad it affected filming, with filming of certain scenes having to be rescheduled. 
But Wells never gave up. He would turn up on set in a wheelchair so he can continue to direct his movie. Wells also had other issues during the filming of Citizen Kane, that being studio executives who would turn up wanting to see footage of the film, but Wells was worried that the executives wouldn't like the footage due to the style of filming which was quite revolutionary, experimental and innovative for its time. So in order to keep the executives from seeing his movie, Wells would distract them by doing magic tricks with cards. Yeah, tricking executives with the power of magic tricks. Orson Welles was all class. Number 4, the makeup effects of Citizen Kane. One of the most striking aspects of Citizen Kane is the movie's makeup effects, where we see a young 20-something Orson Welles age throughout the movie where he becomes an elderly man. It looks flawless and definitely paved the way for makeup effects in movies. So who was the creator of these impressive effects? Well, it was Maurice Seidemann, a Russian immigrant who was aspiring to be a makeup artist in movies and got employed doing odd jobs and errands around the makeup department at RKO. But in his spare time, Siderman would experiment with latex to create facial makeup effects. This caught the attention of Wells, who was so impressed with what he saw, he offered Siderman the job to work on Citizen Kane, where Siderman successfully turned Wells into an elderly man. In addition to that, Citizen Kane's amazing and often draw-dropping cinematography was done by Greg Toland. Toland approached Wells for the job, as he really wanted the creative freedom to try out new, innovative filming techniques, where he was subsequently given the job. And his cinematography definitely makes Citizen Kane more of an experience, as opposed to being just another movie. The cinematography in Citizen Kane is honestly brilliant, and even takes the movie into an almost art house direction. Not to mention the fact that Citizen Kane was scored by the legendary Bernard Herrmann, who would become a frequent collaborator with Alfred Hitchcock, where he scored many of his movies like Psycho and Vertigo, as well as The Twilight Zone and Taxi Driver. And of course, his score for Citizen Kane is brilliant, and nothing short of a masterpiece. Number 3. Recycled Movie Prop there's a scene where Kane visits a beach dining area, which features large birds flying in the background. Considering the production had to work with a limited budget, the birds that were used for the scenes were actually pterodactyls that were created for the 1933 monster movie King Kong, which was also an RKO production. So presumably they were just laying around the studio and Wells got his hands on them and decided to use them for Citizen Kane. Although, there are some claims that the pterodactyl props were actually from the sequel, Son of Kong. Now, I will admit, the first time I saw Citizen Kane, those birds stood out to me. I always felt they looked quite large and almost dinosaur-like. But, you know, I guess it just goes with the surreal and sometimes dream-like nature of the movie, so... Yeah, there's that. But, yeah, it's official, Citizen Kane has dinosaurs. Okay, technically pterodactyls aren't dinosaurs, but you know what I mean. Number 2. The Fate of Rosebud So what became of Rosebud? Kane's childhood sled, the mysterious MacGuffin that ties the movie together, and is without a doubt one of the most important movie props of all time. Well, there were actually several Rosebud sleds that were made, and most of them were actually destroyed and burnt during the movie's production, in order to film the final scene of Rosebud being burned. However, at least one did survive, and it went on auction in 1982, and was purchased by none other than Steven Spielberg, who that very year was at the height of his success thanks to E.T. So what is arguably the greatest movie prop of all time is now in the hands of arguably the greatest director of all time. So I guess it's a happy ending that not all rosebuds were burnt, although it's supposedly still unclear if there are any more rosebuds floating around out there. So who knows, maybe one day another rosebud will be unearthed and we can all celebrate it. Number 1. Citizen Kane was a controversial flop. There was great anticipation with Citizen Kane upon its release, but it only made $1.6 million on an $839,000 budget, so it wasn't very impressive at all. So what went wrong? Well, it supposedly goes back to the powerful media tycoon William Randolph Hearst, who the Charles Foster Kane was semi-based on. 
Hearst was angered and outraged by this. One of his employees even showed up uninvited to a private screening of a rough cut of Citizen Kane. There were threats of lawsuits, and Wells was being threatened to be exposed for having a relationship to a married woman, be that one who was in the process of a divorce. There were so many threats of lawsuits and injunctions, things actually got really, really nasty and ugly. And according to Wells, a police officer supposedly told him once not to return to his hotel room, as there was a plot being put together in which a 14-year-old had been placed in his hotel room wardrobe, along with two photographers. In order in order to do some kind of seedy expose which would have actually seen Wells go to jail. For lack of a better terminology, they were trying to cancel Wells and Citizen Kane. There were actually many attempts to try and get the movie banned and never shown to the public, to the point where Hearst himself banned Citizen Kane to ever be mentioned in his publications. The movie was screened privately to lawyers, who agreed that the movie was safe to be released as long as certain cuts were made so the movie couldn't be connected to Hearst, where about three minutes of the movie were cut out. Wells had to publicly state that Citizen Kane was not about Hearst, but it was too late. The damage had been done. Many theatres refused to screen the movie out of fear of potential retaliation by Hearst. Wells attended the Chicago premiere of Citizen Kane, and the premiere was pretty much empty. Despite getting acclaim from critics, the debacle with Hearst drastically hurt the movie's financial takings. Now I just want to make it clear, I'm not taking any sides or trying to shame anyone or point fingers, but just discussing events that happened and claims that have been made for non-biased educational purposes. Sadly, the release of Citizen Kane doesn't get any better, as it had a very limited European release due to the war. Yeah, just when things couldn't get any worse. It got nominated for many Academy Awards though, including Best Picture, which it did not win, but it did win for Best Original Screenplay. As time passed more and more, people went back and saw Citizen Kane for the masterpiece it was, where it was re-released in 1956. Now the conflict with Hearst was no longer visible, it was all done and dusted, so Citizen Kane could finally be appreciated. Where its popularity has only increased in time, to the point where it's often regarded as the greatest movie of all time, and an amazing accomplishment in the history of cinema. So what is Citizen Kane? Well, it's the story of Rosebud. So what is Rosebud? Well, it's Charles Foster Kane's dying last words. A sled that he played with as a child. It's a symbolism of Kane wanting to escape the complications and corruptions that naturally occur with adulthood, and to return to the joyful innocence of his youth. Rosebud is a dying old man's desire to feel the lost joy and happiness that he once felt as a child. So that was my look into Citizen Kane. I think it's a great film and a truly unique movie experience. So if you love cinema and interested in its creative art form, then you should definitely check out Citizen Kane. Anyway, I'm Minty. And what else can I say but Rosebud? See ya!